Professor Lewis Ritz is on the faculty of the Department of Neuroscience within the University of Florida College of Medicine and also the McKnight Brain Institute. For many years, his focus was on medical and graduate education. He was a course instructor for clinical neuroscience taken by second year medical students and is co-author of the textbook, Medical Neuroscience. He is also director of the campus-wide Center for Spirituality and Health, which offers workshops, academic programs, and interdisciplinary research into the impact of spirituality on health. For the undergraduate honors program, Dr. Ritz directs two courses, Spirituality and Health and Neurotheology. Most impressive of all of his outstanding credentials, the honors students named Dr. Ritz the 2018 Honors Professor of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lewis A. Ritz. Thank you, Joshua, and welcome to everybody to Gainesville and to this conference. Uh, when I um, finished college in 1972, a long time ago, I started asking the big questions of life, and I wanted to uh, uh, understand who am I, why am I here, what's my relationship to the Creator? And so I took two paths, and one was to study the central nervous system, and I subsequently got a PhD in neuroscience, and the other was to get involved in meditation. And um, a couple of early books that influenced me were um, Yogananda's Autobiography of a Yogi and uh, Ram Dass's Be Here Now. And after uh, reading those books and going through college, I spent um, months, uh, probably a year and a half, uh, praying to be led to a God-intoxicated mentor who could help me get answers to my questions. And so I got involved in a, a type of meditation called Surat Shab Yoga. And I will tell you a little bit about the story in a simple PowerPoint today. So the talk, title of my talk is entitled, is, is Shifts of Attention, the Origins of Transcendent Experiences. So I want to start with a little story about Bullish Shah. Bullish Shah was a, um, a Sufi mystic and poet from like the 17th century, I think. Um, th this is as told by a mentor of mine, Rajinder Singh. Uh, Bullah Shah was a great lover of God, so Bullah Shah asked his master, Iniat Shah, how to find God. Iniat Shah, who was, a plant, who was a gardener by profession, told Bullah Shah to take the plant from one side of the garden, uproot it, and plant it in the other side. He said, just like you have taken the plant from one area and put it in another, you have to take your attention from the world outside and focus it at the th single or third eye or the seat of the soul. You will definitely find God. So um, today we're going to talk about attention, a critical attribute um, of our lives. I think it's uh, one of the most important attributes of a human being. We're going to talk about traumatic shifts of attention. I'll talk about objects of attention, the thing, uh, these objects of the world that our attention falls on and we'll have a brief neurological interlude uh, towards the end, and then we'll talk about the passageway to transcendent experiences and expanded consciousness. <clears throat> so, I wanna start with a little parable, and this is a parable about spacesuits. So there was an entity once who was living in its home domain, and it was all conscious, but it decided to leave that domain and explore a, another realm. To do so, it had to put on a spacesuit so it could exist in this other realm. And after a while, it um, decided it wanted to explore a second realm. And so to do so, it had to put on a second spacesuit. So now it's got two spacesuits on. Every time it put on a spacesuit, it had diminished consciousness. So finally, the entity decided to go to a third realm 
and put on a third spacesuit. So now it's got three spacesuits on. Consciousness is diminished with each spacesuit. And um, it explored this third and final realm. The entity spent so much time in, in living in the third realm with these spacesuits on that it only identified itself as the spacesuits and lost its true identity, lost it. <clears throat> it no longer remembered its its origins. And these spacesuits are um, called the mind, our emotions, and our physical frame. The, um, the role of meditation is to retrain our attention so we can reachieve higher states of consciousness that were lost when we put these spacesuits on. So what are dramatic shifts in our attention? This is a uh, picture by Hieronymus Bosch. You've probably seen this before. This is called <clears throat> Ascent of the Blessed, depicting the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe New Jersey is at the end of this tunnel. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> but there are um, several possible shifts of attention, dramatic shifts of attention. These may not be the only ones. The first is the near-death experience, and I consider this a traumatic shift. Um, this could be due to cardiac arrest, a car accident, a drowning, uh, something going, something happening during an operation. The second um, shift of our attention can be with meditation, and I call this a tranquil shift, a gentle shift, much more preferred than a near-death experience. And finally, there is the transition called death, which our attention will be withdrawn from the physical frame, and who knows what happens after that. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> the, next, the next question is, what normally controls our attention? Do we control it? Does our mind control it? Who's under control? Does the world control our attention? <clears throat> Excuse me. One of, the, um, one of the analogies that many masters have used is that of a chariot. So the soul is the rider of the chariot, and the, and the uh, driver of the chariot is the mind. The reins going to the horses is our emotions, and the horses are uh, our sense organs that run wild in the fields of sense objects. Um, this is, our, this is our situation. So a thought experiment with a picture of a pail with some rocks in it. I couldn't figure out how to really animate this, so we just have to just call this a thought experiment. So we, we, we want to fill a pail up, and we fill a pail with some, some large rocks, which are depicted here. And then we, um, then we add small rocks to the pail, and then we add some pebbles to the pail, and then we add some sand to the pail, and we mix it up. So what if our sense organs could only perceive the large rocks for whatever reason? Um, what if our physical instruments could only perceive the, uh, the large rocks? And we, were, we would be totally unaware of the, um, the other rocks, the smaller rocks, and the pebbles and the sand that are in this bucket. <clears throat> and that's our plight. Uh, mystics will tell us that it's all right here. The physical world and the spiritual worlds, they're all right here, but they are at different frequencies. Frequencies that we're not able to uh, comprehend or, or um, sense with our normal um, physical um, sensory apparatus. Eben Alexander, uh, you probably heard of him, the neurosurgeon who had a uh, brush with death, <clears throat> and it was written up in, the, um, in his book, Proof of Heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says that the, this other grander universe isn't, away, isn't far away physically, but simply exists on a different frequency. We are unaware of it because for the most part we are closed off to those frequencies on which it manifests. For all we know, there's actually 
small pebbles or small rocks, pebbles, and sand in this picture, but we're just, we just can't sense it. So when I, when I think of our attention, which is the, you know, a major point of this, um, of this talk, I think of each of us um, uh, as a beacon of attention. Thank you. Um, each of us is a beacon of attention. It's like a flashlight. And we shine our attention on something. We shine our attention in the outside world. We shine our attention on this, this room today. And um, where our attention falls, when, a, when our attention falls on an object of attention, whatever that object is, we are aware of it. And um, this attention, um, as mystics will teach us, emanates from the soul or the atma and works its way through the three spacesuits and then through the brain's mechanisms of attention, it's, it's distributed, our attention is distributed to the outside world. We're aware of the objects of attention that our attention falls on. We're not aware of objects of attention that our attention does not fall on. That's sort of a basic premise. So as we go through life, we can be, um, <clears throat> what I have, what I'm trying to depict here is two worlds and we have our attention falling on the physical world and we're all quite aware of it when we drive our car or whatever. And uh, we're not aware of the spiritual world because our attention is not falling on it. Um, if, however, something happens to us, like a near-death experience or perhaps in meditation, we can learn to shift our attention and move off the physical world momentarily or for a while, and, <clears throat> and experience the spiritual realms. Excuse me. Now, as we go through life, the question is, what, what are we really paying attention to? And I, I believe there's four categories of, of objects that we can pay attention to. The first is the outside world, and I'm depicted here um, in Millennium Park in Chicago. You may have seen the egg if you've been there. And that meant the outside world. We can be aware of things in the outside world. The second is our physical bodies. We can be aware of our physical bodies. We're especially aware of it if we're in discomfort, if we're in pain, we've got a toothache or whatever. But you know, you may not even be aware of, you may not be thinking about your bodies right now. You may be, um, um, you know, focus on the conference and not paying that much attention to our, to your physical body. The third object of attention is our emotions. Whether we're happy or sad or, or fearful or angry, etc. The fourth object of attention, what I'm trying to depict is the mind. And I believe that the mind grabs our attention and just demands our attention all the time. You wake up at four in the morning, it's there talking to you. And who's, who's talking and who's paying attention? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> now, um, I want to take a, a second just to go off and, and talk about a, um, uh, I'm going to have my, my neurological inter, uh, interlude here. This is an experiment, and I just, let's see if I can do this. Okay, this, this is an experiment in which people were in an MRI tube and they were asked to focus on something. And what happened, and their brains were imaged and we got uh, an idea where, uh, what parts of the brain were um, activated during the focus process. Then after a while, they would lose their focus and their minds would, wandering, would wander. They would become aware of their minds wandering and then they would shift their attention back to the focus. Uh, what I'm really trying to show here is that there are two modes of the mind. The mind is always active. It's almost impossible to quiet the mind. It's always active. You can either control the mind or it runs on its own. And so uh, when we use our attention networks, 
to focus the mind on whatever conversation, reading a book or whatever, uh, we're going to control things. Otherwise, the mind runs on its own, and that's called mind wandering or daydreaming. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Science has shown that. We wander into the past, we wander into the future, none of which exists. So, um, some scientists did an interesting uh, study. I think this is relevant, very relevant to, to my discussion here. Some scientists, and this is not the scientific publication, the publication was Brain and Behavior a couple years ago, but it got picked up the Wall Street Journal, and I decided to use that, their depiction of this. And it has to do with the mantra. And what they were showing is, is that techniques using a mantra, and I think a lot of spiritual techniques are using a mantra. When, when uh, people use a mantra, now a mantra being a set of words, they can be spiritual, they can be secular. When you use a set of words, um, like during a meditation, the activity of the mind-wandering network, which is called the default mode network, we got these two networks, we've got an intention network and we've got a default mode network, well, mind wandering is associated with the activity of the default mode network of the brain. When we do a mantra, as in meditation, the activity of the default mode network is greatly reduced. We can begin to rein in the mind, quiet the mind a little bit by using a mantra. Now, what I'm going to hopefully explain to you is this idea of consciousness evolves when the self dissolves. I love the title of this talk. This is, this is actually a, 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 not a talk, but it was a publication by Dr. James Austin. Um, Jim uh, uh, is, a, uh, is the retired chair of neurology at the University of Colorado, and um, he wrote an interesting uh, set of books. In 1998, he published a book called Zen and the Brain, and that book, to me, is at the forefront of brain be meditation uh, uh, studies. He's gone on to publish about four or five other books. One listed here, or shown here, is uh, Selfless Insight, Zen and the Meditative Transformation of Consciousness. Um, but I like the title that he gave us here, Consciousness Evolves When the Self Dissolves. By the way, Jim is in the audience. Could you just wave your hand, Jim? I'm probably embarrassing him, but he's, he's in the audience, and uh, um, I'm just delighted that he's here today, and um, um, I'm, I'm sort of paying homage to his, his uh, friendship and, and uh, the work that he's done. So. Getting down to the last couple slides. So the question is, as we go through life, what is, what are we paying attention to? The, the human body is like this giant satellite dish, and we're picking up all sorts of information, sensory information from the outside world, sensory information from the inside world. We're picking up our emotions. We're picking up our mind. We're paying attention to all of this stuff. And what are we paying attention to? I'm saying, what channel are we watching? We're watching, we could be watching all four of these channels, the channel of the world, the channel of the body, the channel of the emotions, and the channel of the mind. So, um, but what if, what if during meditation, we sit down and we're quiet, and we stop paying attention to the outside world? We're in a quiet room, might be in our home, uh, but it's really quiet. We're not paying attention to the outside world. And what happens if we're not paying attention to our body? Our sensory systems are shut down. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not looking at anything. We're not hearing anything. We're in a quiet environment. We're not touching anybody. We're not smelling anything. We're not tasting anything. So we lose two of these channels. Now, these channels are really loud, typically. They're easy to pick up. We all pick them up. But... What's interesting is every night we go to sleep and we turn off two of these channels. We turn off the world and the body. So that should be easy for us to do. We can all do that. 
So then we got this channel called emotions. What if we sit down and meditate? And if you're a seasoned meditator for a while, you, you can begin to quiet your emotions. First of all, meditation is great at showing us, this, showing us our emotions. It's a mirror to our inner landscape. And, um, and working through the frontal lobes, meditation can help quiet our emotions. So that's another channel. And then we got this last channel. This is the, this is the real uh, stickler. This is, this is the tough channel to uh, turn off. But as I just tried to show you, we can quiet the mind by using a mantra. And um, what are we left with? What are we left with? What, are we, what channel are we watching then? Well, there's another channel that I have on here, which I call a sacred channel. And it be, it, this channel is the third or the single eye, which Inyat Shah told Bullet Shah to put his attention on. And um, this is one depiction of this third or single eye, which I'm going to call the sacred channel that we can tune into, a subtle aspect of human beings that allows us to go beyond the physical world and burrow our way into the spiritual realms. Um, we have a person, um, <clears throat> this is, I should give credit to, um, to Alex Gray in Sacred Mirrors. Um, I call this Gray's Anatomy where he's showing the chakras, but the, um, but the third or single eye is up here at the top. It's where you're, if you close your eyes, your, your attention's gonna be drawn there. So that, I'm calling that the sacred channel. I, this slide is entitled, Sit Still and Be Quiet. Did any of your parents tell you that when you were young? <laughs> they were giving you meditation instructions. <laughs> uh, little did we know. Um, so ep ethical living is a foundation to meditation, but then there's the meditation practice. The one I'm describing here is Jyoti meditation and uh, when, we, when we can focus our attention on this sacred channel, uh, we can begin to transcend awareness of our physical body and this physical realm, and we can enter into the spiritual realms that are all around us and within us. And um, this is my final slide. This is, I think this picture is called the seeker, and this is a peak experience not P-E-A-K, but P-E-E-K. And um, when, we, when we begin to focus our attention at the third or single eye, we can realize a number of things. We can see inner light, we can see uh, circles of light, light of, any, of different colors, um, flashes of light. We can go beyond that and you can see an inner sky, you can see an inner moon, you can see an inner sun, and then you go beyond that, and um, the real journey of spirituality can begin. By doing this, we realize we're not the body, we're not the emotions, we're not the mind, we are something else, we are soul or atma. And um, we can realize that uh, the light of God shines in every person and interconnects all of us. Thank you very much.